This was a trip to AMD, sponsored by AMD and MSI. Oh my God, we went to Austin, Texas, to the AMD campus, and they drove us into a lake. <laughs> but no, it was the good sort of driving you into a lake, if such a thing exists. But that was toward the end of the trip. Let's do the other stuff about the trip first. So first off, big thanks to MSI and the MSI Dragon Squad and AMD for uh, making it all happen. It was really pretty amazing. Here we are on the campus at AMD in Austin. This place is massive, eight buildings in all. The main building we spent most of our time in was the Summit. We were here for three full days of nothing but information absorption from AMD executives, which was an unusual experience to say the least. Not that it was bad, it was actually quite good. It was just a very unusual experience to get you know, that much alone time with executives to be able to ask questions and see what they're working on. First up, we got a sort of orientation from Mr. Gerald Youngblood. Where is AMD today? Where have they been? Where are they going? What's the philosophy of the company? And it was really interesting. They had a slide deck prepared that included, among other things, sort of a timeline of accomplishments that is sort of on the radar of current AMD executives. Things like the first company with a viable 64-bit x86 architecture. Things like the first consumer truly, you know, dual-core CPU, you know, for consumers. Uh, the first company with an HBM product and all these kinds of things were on the timeline, which says that, you know, these are executives that are, you know, technical, even the non-technical quote unquote executives are pretty technical and pretty interested in these, these feats for, from AMD, you know, in its 47 year history as of the time of this video. Now, AMD knows that they're still, you know, a small company, relatively speaking. I mean, we saw a world map where they're in, you know, 20 or 30 locations worldwide. I mean, AMD's all over the world, but compared to the competition, they're still a pretty small company. You know, they have a relatively small R&D budget. They have a lot of diverse products and a lot of diverse markets, even beyond the PC. Things like consoles, that's the obvious one, but there are also military products. There are also enterprise products. Um, they're APUs. I mean, an, an APU, you know, you guys know APUs and it's like, wait, an APU, what, an APUs are used in the enterprise? Yes, they're used in really high density virtual desktop infrastructure uh, applications in the enterprise because you can cram a ton of APU appliances inside a rack mount chassis. So. Some companies are worried about secrets leaving the company and people having crap on their machines that they really shouldn't have on their machines. Well, VDI is one way to deal with that. And one way that you can cram 200 people onto a 5U rack mount machine is to have a ton of APU dedicated machines inside the server. And we get to see all of that on the AMD campus. It was really pretty amazing. We saw digital signage, electronic jukeboxes, slot machines, arcade machines, and a lot of this AMD tech is often used in novel ways. Another thing that the executives were quick to point out is that AMD is, you know, the only company that does both high performance x86 and high performance graphics. In the marketplace, there are companies that do high performance x86 and high performance graphics, but not the two of those things together. And so anything that gives AMD a unique advantage combining the two together is where AMD has seen success in the marketplace, not just the PC market again, just sort of the global marketplace for all the different kinds of products that you might have. AMD is also looking to get more plugged into communities, hence this trip, eSports and being better connected to what enthusiasts want. That's part of the reason for Ryzen. They don't want their competition to keep driving a four core market. The time for that is just about over. Mr. Youngblood stressed investment in developing the ecosystem and support systems for these products. They feel like they've got the CPUs and the hardware now and everything else is up to sort of developing the secondary markets. So eSports, so enthusiasts, so people that are working in the enterprise, people that are working on desktop computers, workstations, that sort of thing. So not part of that, but I looped myself into the shareholder presentation of sorts, the annual update from Lisa Su, which happened I think on Tuesday or Wednesday that we were there at AMD. And that was one of the things that she was echoing in her statements was, you know, R&D is a big thing for AMD. Graphics card sales are way, way up. Uh, you know, the, the RX 480 or RX 400 series graphics cards sales were, were, I guess, better than expected or very, very strong. So they're expecting the RX 500 series cards to be as strong. They're still, you know, very, very competitive cards for, for the marketplace, but um, they're finding their niche. So that's, 
that's exciting. That's really, really exciting. But next up was Mark Tran, who went through MSI's full Ryzen product lineup. Now these are 18 products that are available now. There was no ITX boards. We did ask about ITX, but you know, sort of mums the word on ITX. Can't talk about unreleased products. So we didn't really learn much about ITX, but we did learn about the Pro series of motherboards, which is for, you know, sort of professionals or people that will be using Ryzen CPUs as a full workstation or something like that. So this is really exciting from, from MSI. We also learned about uh, Mystic Light and other features of the motherboard and the things that sort of differentiate the individual SKUs uh, on the, uh, you know, on sort of on the lineup from, from MSI. And so Mark did a great job of breaking that down and breaking down the, the reasoning behind, you know, different selection and uh, the, the sort of design philosophy that went into all of the boards that were available. There are four different levels uh, you know, of gamer motherboard from MSI, depending on, on what somebody is looking for. And we ended up playing, you know, League of Legends on several different MSI systems. And it was really exciting. There was lots of technical information and, and lots of, of other information about MSI's product stack, which was really exciting. Next up was my favorite part of the whole trip, Robert Halleck. Now I had already had several chats with him about IO, MMU and Linux support. And this meeting was great. So big thanks again to MSI for making it happen. We had a quickie brass tacks working session on some of the lingering issues. Uh, and I feel a lot better about those issues now that I'm uh, uh, with IO MMU after our chats. Now, Robert Halleck and I had a chance to do a really good working session, just a quickie working session about IO MMU, Linux support, um, and we went over the issues and the, the work that I have done and maybe there's some driver workarounds and a whole bunch of stuff with IO MMU. And I gotta tell you, I feel a lot better about the IO MMU situation on Ryzen after having a chance to actually talk to the man himself and those communication lines are open. Now there's a lot of other stuff that AMD has to deal with first. First and foremost is RAM compatibility, but the fact that IO MMU and several other super technical things that we talked about is on AMD's radar and being taken seriously, I really feel a lot better about that situation. We also spoke at length about memory timings and the fixes that are coming there with Ryzen. If you want Ryzen today and you want the fastest memory you can get, which benefits the platform, just get Samsung B-Die memory. Uh, B-Die memory is, is the most compatible. It's basically plug and play. You should be able to get that up and running at at least 2933, if not 3200, without very much headache at all. That said, other memory will work, but you may have to do some fiddling if you want the higher speeds. I plan to do a separate video on the stuff that I learned there. We went through quite a lot of detailed information in the UEFI and the specific RAM settings that uh, AMD has asked of MSI to put in their UEFI. So I understand a lot better about the relationship between voltage, memory, timing, termination, uh, resistance, and a lot of other stuff. So look for a separate video on that soon. We also spoke about chipsets and technical features, and most exciting to me was a conversation I had with Mr. Halleck about the X300 chipset. Now, the exciting thing about X300 is that it's a chipset about the size of your, your fingernail on your pinky finger. Um, but, you know, Ryzen has 24 PCI Express lanes, 16 for the GPU, four for the chipset, and then four for NVMe. But with the X300 chipset, it doesn't use either of the X4 lanes. So you can have uh, PCI Express 3.0 by eight coming off of the CPU. You could take that into a PLX bridge, whatever the manufacturer wants to do. Uh, Mr. Halleck explained that that gave OEMs the maximum flexibility for implementing Ryzen, however they see fit on any platform, not just, you know, necessarily small form factor machines where board space is at a premium. You could also have micro ATX or even full ATX motherboards that use the X300 chipset if there is market demand for it and be able to have even more PCI Express 3.0 connectivity because you bypass the chipset. So it's easy to imagine a PCI Express, uh, you know, like a PLX bridge or something like that, connecting to a PCI Express 3.0 10 gig ethernet adapter, more NVMe, whatever. That's great news, honestly. I did not realize that the X300 chipset provided that level of flexibility because it doesn't use any of the PCI Express lanes, which is great. We also went over the MSI UEFI option A XMP, which uh, AMD is directly tweaking to work with the memory compatibility, memory timing thing. So 
their goal is to make it so that you buy any kit of memory that is XMP or has an XMP profile, you plug it in and AXMP looks at that, reads it, makes the appropriate adjustments for Ryzen and you're done. You don't have to think about it. Next up, Ontal Tungler, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, I probably am. Uh, went over changes for the RX 500 series graphics cards, which could honestly be its own video. Now you guys probably all know and realize that the RX, you know, 580, 570, 560 are um, incremental upgrades over the 480, 470, 460. It's the same um, chipset, it's the same sort of die, it's just been a tweaked process and some tweaked things about the card. Uh, the 460 has some unlocked shaders. Uh, there are some other tweaks in software and some other tweaks to the platform for the other 500 series cards, with the exception of the RX 550, which is the most exciting card to me. Um, I've since decided to pick up an RX 550 because it's DisplayPort 1.4, has a hardware H.265 decoder, and should be the ideal card for a home theater system or something like that because it does all this stuff in hardware. What's more is that um, from launch day, it's gonna be available in a half height configuration, so it's perfect and suitable. Um, for OEM machines. So if you have a, you know, a white box system or like a Dell Optiplex or an HP, you know, small form factor machine, you can get a 550 and put it in there. What's more, the price point, under $100. Uh, the RX 550 that I picked up was right around $75 US. Seems reasonable. Gonna try to build a home theater machine out of it for a video and see how that goes. One of the things that I asked about during the RX 500 series presentation is what's the difference between Radeon Chill and frame rate targeting. And there are some big differences between frame rate targeting and Radeon Chill. Now, if you're not familiar, Radeon Chill is uh, marketed, I guess, as intelligent software that makes the video card not work any harder than it has to. So like if you're in a menu and your graphics card immediately goes to 5,000 FPS because all it has to do is draw a menu, it's gonna generate heat and it's just gonna make the fan run loud and it's not gonna be a good situation. Frame rate targeting is more like your display operates at 60 Hertz the game is going to run at, at 60 fps the problem with that is that if um if the graphics card starts drawing a frame and you click the mouse button you're going to have to wait 16 milliseconds for the next frame to come in before the graphics card can respond so if you're playing a game like csgo or something like that you really want the game to respond faster than every 1 60th of a second. So what Chill does is Chill looks at the inputs and looks at what the person is doing and decides if it needs to run faster or slower or whatever it needs to do in order to respond faster. So it's a, it's a, a little different implementation than frame rate targeting, uh, but it's really only applicable for games that are gonna run at a really insane frame rate. It's also gonna be really super applicable on mobile platforms, things like laptops, because you can really save battery life and energy by not running more frames than you really need to for a laptop. So you, if you have a laptop and you wanna target 60 FPS, then you can save a bunch of energy by not rendering the extra frames, but also not have to deal with the um, increased latency because you'll have a little bit of variability in terms of how the machine responds once you actually start doing something. So like if you have a laptop that has a 100 hertz display and you do something in the middle of a frame, it can respond immediately for that one frame and then just keep going every 60 milliseconds or every, uh, you know, or it can just keep going every 16 milliseconds or every 10 milliseconds or, you know, whatever frame rate you're wanting to target or whatever kind of performance metric you're wanting to target. Both days we had lunch right on site at the AMD Summit. Uh, the AMD cafeteria is a beautiful open room. The buildings were bright and advanced and the conversations all around us were about code and pull requests and all sorts of super technical engineering things that you might imagine. We also got to do a lot of Ryzen testing. We played some VR games and we got a lot of <laughs> League of Legends in. We played 3 vs 3 ARAM on all the Ryzen systems. The system that I played on was 144 hertz and it was, it was buttery smooth. It was really nice. Of course, it's League of Legends, so I mean, not really super taxing to begin with, but hey, 144 hertz, that's pretty cool. I met many new friends and I really had a great time. <laughs> After drinking from the information fire hose on the AMD campus, they fed us some great Texas barbecue and we went on a duck tour and hung out as a group with the AMD executives. And that's the uh, that's where they drove us into the lake. It was an amphibious bus. So we all piled onto a bus and it was literally like the whole Lyndon B. Johnson 
uh, you know, oh my God, the brakes are out. We're headed right for the thing. Not really, but sort of, kind of. We, uh, <laughs> we made a splash down in the lake with some impact and that was a lot of fun. So we drove around the, the lake and got to see, you know, all the homes that belong to all the like super wealthy people because they were all like $10 million houses. And we drove over to the dam on the lake and then turned it around and, and went back in. And that was a lot of fun. We really, honestly, we had a lot of fun, made a lot of new friends. I really had a great time. I did ask a lot more questions about um, open sourcing the platform security processor and a lot of other questions like that around open source, uh, improving virtualization features, fixing some of the bugs other than just IOMMU and those kind of questions. Uh, but there's nothing really that I can report on those specific items. I do feel like that everything that I asked about is being taken seriously by AMD and they are seriously considering working with their uh, partners because it's not just an AMD decision. Other companies are involved in those kinds of things, especially things like opening up the platform security processor. And so while Robert Halleck did not have any kind of an update on that for us, based on my conversations with him, I do feel like that's being taken seriously. So that's nice. I'm feeling a, a lot better about the future possibilities of those kinds of esoteric things that you know all the super nerds are interested in um, a, as a result of this trip. So big thanks again to MSI and the Dragon Squad for making me feel welcome, for making me feel like one of you guys, I guess, because I don't know, a Dragon Squad, uh, it's a thing. So this was the, uh, the best secret of Ryzen trip. Uh, there's a link in the description. I'm going to submit this video um, to a, a MSI's social page thing. And if you want to vote for it in the coverage of the trip, because MSI is like, who liked the coverage the best? Then I would really appreciate that. That'll, that'll be pretty great. I'll also be hanging out on the forums at Level 1 Techs in case you have any questions. Or did you ask about this? Or did you ask about that? Or what did you see? What did you see? Uh, I'll be on the forum at Level 1 Techs. And you can, you, can, you can find me there. So again, big thanks. I'm Wendell, signing out. I'll see you later. Now MSI made this trip happen and they want to know what the fans think of it. So please vote in the description. There's a link that will let you vote for level one for this coverage of the trip to uh, AMD in Austin, Texas. Thanks. I appreciate it.